Friends in Christ, in this Lenten season, we have heard our Lord's call to struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and each other. This is the struggle to which we were called at baptism. Within the community of the church, God never wearies of forgiving sin and giving the peace of reconciliation. On this night, let us confess our sin against God and our neighbor and enter into the celebration of the great three days reconciled with God and with one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, source of all love, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus gave us a new commandment to love one another as he loves us. Write this commandment in our hearts and give us the will to serve others as he was servant of all. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading for Monday Thursday comes from Exodus, the 12th chapter. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. This is how you shall eat it, your loins skirted, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. And now we will read Psalm 116 responsively. I love the Lord who has heard my voice and listened to my supplication. For the Lord has given ear to me whenever I called. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things God has done for me. I will lift the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. Precious in your sight, O Lord, is the death of your servants. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. 
I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 13th chapter. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, Jesus got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher. And Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Sisters and brothers, dear friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what I have done to you. It was one of those questions that Jesus was used to asking and one of those questions that the disciples were used to hearing. Do you know what I have done to you? It's a question that begged for their attention and required them to begin looking back and forth in their minds. What was it that he had done and what did it mean? Well, the first part was easy. What he had done was to wash their feet. It was a common gesture in those dusty, sandal-wearing days. Folks who spent any time outside at all, folks who traveled, folks who were made to feel welcome at a special occasion, all those folks were used to having their feet washed as they came into the house. It was what you did in those days. It's different now, of course. We don't do feet very much, at least not when we're in church, not when we're in church. We speak of reaching out to each other. The ELCA's tagline is God's work, our hands, and that's good. We support each other. We embrace each other with the arms of Christ. We like that. We offer a shoulder to each other or a, a listening ear or even a heart to help carry each other's burdens just as Jesus did and we feel very good about all that but feet 
for all of our talk about being the body of Christ, we don't really like to imagine the feet that go with that body. The feet get bent out of shape, you see. They, uh, they get confined in shoes and socks or hose. Feet get buckled up, strapped in, tied down, as though they were somehow dangerous creatures. But it didn't used to be that way. Feet were just out there in Jesus' time. And the roads and the streets were hot and dusty, and sandals let in the dust, and so it was a usual thing, a normal thing, a good thing, to have your feet washed. Of course, the thing that was different that evening was the one who had done it. Washing feet was a task handed over to the servants or to the younger members of the family or to folks whose feet and whose needs were judged to be less important than those above them. And here it was, here they were, and the one asking the question was their teacher, and he was the one who had only just finished drying his hands on the towel that he tied around his waist. Do you know what I have done to you? So there must have been something deeper. There must have been something more at stake than just the fact that all of them had much cleaner feet now than they'd had just a few moments ago. What could it mean? And Jesus, who had already given them so much, gave them the answer. Do you know what I have done to you? I have set you an example, he told them. After all the words, he now came to them with deeds to demonstrate what he asked of them. As clearly as he knew how, he showed them the way to behave to each other. As plainly as possible, Jesus showed them what it meant to be one of his followers. Do you know what I have done to you? I have set you an example, he said. So care for one another. Care for each other in big ways and small. Feed those who are hungry. Shelter those who are cold. Welcome those who are stranger. Open your hearts to those who are lonely and alone. Do you know what I have done to you? I have set you an example, he says. So respect each other. Honor each other for the dignity that comes with being created in God's own image. Remember that servants are not greater than their masters and that we are all called to be servants to each other. Recognize in each other God's handiwork and never forget that each of us is God's beloved child. Finally, do you know what I have done to you? I have set you an example, Jesus says, to love one another. Strive for what is best for the other person. Want what is good for your neighbor. Live in such a way that your life reflects the light of God and so helps others find the path of righteousness and truth. Do you know what I have done to you? Jesus asked his disciples. I have set you an example of care, of love and respect. Live those things out for each other. And do you know what happens after Jesus washes their feet, beloved? Do you know where the story goes after this and what happens next in all of the other Gospels? First, Jesus is the servant, and then he becomes the host at a dinner party to which all the disciples have been invited. As host, Jesus is the one who offers the prayers. Jesus is the one who starts the after-dinner speeches. And Jesus is the one who suddenly changes everything they thought they knew and everything that they had expected. For at the dinner table that night, Jesus took the bread and blessed and broke it and said these astonishing words. This is my body. And he offered to them to eat, and they did. They ate, probably wondering what it meant and what it would do and whether it would somehow change them. They ate the bread, the most common, ordinary thing on that Passover table, bread that they had eaten their whole lives, bread that had strengthened them and nourished them and filled their bellies when they were hungry. And now it was something else. 
With his words, it had become something new, something different. The bread of this meal was transformed. They ate, as they ate, they took into themselves the body of Jesus, which strengthened them, nourished them, and satisfied their hunger. And they were changed. Oh, not so that you could see it on the outside, not any more than the bread looked any different than it had said, than it was before he said the words, but with the words, with his promise. The bread that they ate was a part of him that would become a part of them, and their lives were changed. In the same way, after dinner, he took a cup of wine and said, This is my blood. And while folks in Jesus' day were vague about biology, they understood that blood was necessary for life, and that life was somehow connected to the blood, and they did not distinguish between the two. So when Jesus said, this is my blood, and offered it to them, what he offered them was his life, once more to become a part of theirs as they drank it together with him. It was an astonishing thing that he did, and in those few words he transformed not only the lives of the people at supper with him that night, but also the whole idea of the Passover meal. It is still a meal to celebrate. It is still a meal that speaks of God's deep and abiding love. It is still a meal rooted in God's promise to free God's children. But for those of us who follow Jesus, that night it became the Lord's Supper, an ongoing opportunity for Jesus' disciples to strengthen their faith in a meal where Jesus would be really present, both as host and in the bread and wine broken and poured out. More than that, Jesus said, do this. And in the introduction, in the instruction, made the promise that he would always be present for his disciples as they shared this meal. Does this meal change our lives? I believe it does, but in ways that only you will be able to determine and only gradually as each stone that you throw into a, the water changes the course of the river. What I know is this, that in this meal we will taste the promise of God. We will taste God's promise to be with us, to nourish us and to love us for all the days of our lives. May each of us taste that promise again. Amen.
turning our hearts to God who is gracious and merciful. We pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of love, unite your church in its commitment to humble service. Make us your faithful disciples. Speak words of truth and grace through us. Encourage us in self-giving acts of kindness. Let us love one another as you have loved us. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, tend to flocks, fields, and vineyards. Bring, bring favorable weather for crops to grow. Guide the hands of those who cultivate, farm, and garden. Let the earth flourish so that all may eat and be satisfied. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, you give us a new commandment, to have love for one another. We give thanks for organizations that respond to disasters and for agencies that offer relief and humanitarian aid to populations in need. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, give ear to all who call upon you for any need of body or spirit. Provide for those who do not have enough to eat, those who are unemployed or under underemployed, and those who rely on the generosity of others. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, you invite us to your table of mercy. Heal all divisions between your people. Extend the hospitality of this table, of your table, beyond the walls of our churches and our homes, that your love and welcome may be made known to all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, glorify your servants who walked by faith in this life and who now feast with you. Inspire us by the sacrifice of those who were imprisoned, persecuted, or martyred for their faith, especially Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. According to your steadfast love, O God, hear these prayers and all our prayers as we commend them to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, God of my salvation, when at night I cry out in your presence, let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like those who have no help. Like those forsaken among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they, have, they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions of dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a thing of horror to them, I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call on you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the shades rise up to praise you? 
Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your saving help in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O Lord, cry out to you. In the morning my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast me off? Why do you hide your face from me? Wretched and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am desperate. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dread assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. From all sides, they close in on me. You have caused friend and neighbor to shun me. My companions are in darkness.